Okay. Yeah, I'm Kay Wagner, and I'm the chair of the Natural Resources Committee for the uh, Tompkins County League of Women Voters. And I'm very happy to see all of you here today. Uh, well, the question we want to look at this evening is really the economic aspects of uh, the issue of hy hydraulic fracturing. Um, very often, uh, when people are talking about environmental issues, uh, the way they look at things is they put the environment over here and safeguarding the environment and the economy over here and seem to feel that anything one does to preserve the environment uh, definitely is going to hurt the economy and that, uh, you know, the environment should be basically uh, put at risk in order to have the economy be a healthy one. And uh, the issues really are much more complicated than that. And the, the way in which environmental issues and economic issues are interwoven and their impacts on each other is tremendously complicated. And we can only scratch the surface of it here today. But that's what we're going to attempt to do. And so we have three uh, great panelists. First, um, Susan, Professor Susan Christofferson, she's uh, with the city, uh, Department of City and Regional Planning at Cornell in the uh, College of Architecture, Art and Planning. Um, and John, Professor John Schwartz right here, he's a retired uh, physics professor from Ithaca College. And Don Barber right back here. Um, so he's the uh, town supervisor for the town of Caroline and the chair of the uh, County Council of Go Governments. Uh, now they're each going to give a presentation and then after the presentations are done you'll have a chance to uh, ask questions um, and hopefully we'll have a lively uh, discussion going on here. Okay, so thank you and I'll, I'll let, yeah? No, we're, we're going to do it differently, okay? Okay, we'll give you some instructions on ans asking questions at the very end. Yes? What? Cell phones turn off. Oh, yes, yes. All cell phones off, please. <laughs> Thank you. I should check my own. <laughs> okay, so Susan? Okay, um, I'm Susan Christofferson and I am a uh, professor in the City and Regional Planning Department at Cornell and I'm very, very happy to be able to speak to the League of Women Voters, which I have a deep regard for, um, and the audience that they've invited tonight, um, and to many of my neighbors and colleagues and friends who are also in the audience. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a project that uh, looks it at the economic consequences of uh, what it has the, the complex name of high volume hydro fracturing, hydraulic fracturing. It's a special kind of uh, vertical natural gas, excuse me, a special kind of natural gas drilling. Um, that uses millions of gallons of water. Um, I may just simply refer to this as natural gas drilling when I'm giving the talk because I don't want to say high volume hydraulic fracturing every time I do this. But um, that's what I'm referring to. Um, this project, uh, or the, what I'm going to present tonight is the results of a project that has been funded by the Park Foundation in Ithaca and the uh, Heinz Endowments in Pittsburgh. And they were very interested in um, getting beyond the economic impact studies uh, that had been done to evaluate the economic uh, consequences of uh, natural gas drilling in New York and Pennsylvania. Now, as um, some of you, very few of you in the audience know about input-output models, one person I know does, <laughs> um, uh, the uh, consequences that were uh, determined, the estimates of jobs and taxes and impacts were based on input-output models. And um, input-output mo models are models, and they just present projections. Um, 
And uh, so the foundations really wanted to look at a broader range of um, consequences, economic consequences. And so last summer, we went about trying to look at this, uh, some of these questions. And I'm going to briefly present some of our results. Um, they're uh, presented in much more detail on my website, which is, uh, I th will be on the screen at the end of this. And we've just posted three new uh, policy uh, working papers on that website. So if you're interested in any of these questions, you might go there. Um, but I want to give you an overview. I think that our, our task really was um, to tell people or help people think about how to think about economic consequences. How should we think about what's going to happen with natural gas drilling in New York? And I'll just talk specifically about New York tonight. Um, that's a much more complicated question than you would imagine. Um, now, um, as most of you do know, the Marcellus Shale is one play in a, a national natural gas uh, boom. And um, it's the largest. And it's right now uh, considered to have the best economics. It's, it's where uh, drilling is taking place at the fastest rate. The uh, drilling permits in uh, Pennsylvania have gone from uh, 71 in 2007 to almost 2,000 today. Um, so one of the things we have to understand is why there's been this very rapid ramp up in the Marcellus Shale. Because if New York State opens up to drilling, we are likely to experience that same very rapid ramp up. And what I want to tell you tonight, or or present is that that has very important implications. The speed, the pace of drilling, how many wells are drilled in what period of time. Um, now, I, I just want to say, and this is just obvious, but I think it's important to say when we're talking about uh, economic questions, and as, as Kay mentioned, the environmental and public health questions related to Marcellus Shale gas drilling are absolutely critical. And, and even though tonight we're going to be talking mostly about economic issues, I don't want to uh, pretend that they aren't. They are absolutely critical. And uh, in some ways, they, I feel that they take precedence. So when we talk about uh, some of the issues we're talking about tonight, um, I think we also have to keep in our mind that um, they, they are uh, parallel to, um, but don't um, supersede our concern for the environment. Um, so when we set about doing this economic development um, study, um, and I should say, I teach economic development in the Department of City and Regional Planning. Uh, so I have a long-term interest in creating jobs in New York. I've done lots of studies of um, manufacturing. I'm the manufacturing matters lady. I, I'm really intent on building manufacturing in upstate New York, um, which may seem like a fool's errand to some of you, but not me. Um, <laughs> um, and so um, I, I went into this thinking, OK, I'm going to look, try to look fairly at whether this is going to create jobs, what kinds of jobs it's going to create, and what the impacts are going to be. Um, and one of the things that I think that we came to over the course of this past year is the conclusion that um, the environmental studies, the SGEIS, the famous Supplemental Generic Environmental Impact Statement, which took me about three months to be able to say correctly, um, um, it focuses on wells, on individual wells. And in fact, the economic impact reports that had been done in Broome County and in Pennsylvania um, also looked at investment at the, well set, at the well pad. They were focused on the individual well. And then they would accumulate the, the impacts uh, across wells. In fact, one of the conclusions we came to is that 
if you're going to understand the economic impact or the economic effects of natural gas drilling, you really need to look at the cumulative effect of having uh, uh, one uh, number of wells, a number of wells, rather than another number of wells. So for example, if there are 10 wells drilled in Tompkins County, that will have a very different cumulative effect than if there are 1,000 wells drilled, particularly if, the, if there, you get 10 wells drilled in one year versus 1,000, which is one of the predictions that we have of 1,000 wells being drilled in one year. Um, that uh, has a, a cumulative effects because of um, not just what goes on at the well pad, but because of all the facilities and services associated with uh, natural gas drilling and because of what has to happen to make that well pad operative, um, trucks mainly. <laughs> um, so the, the, um, the second um, kind of uh, principle that we went with or assumption that we went with um, um, in looking at, at economic impact um, is to say, um, to look at what kind of local and regional impacts are likely with a capital intensive resource extraction industry. Um, and, and that is to look at what kinds of jobs and investments are going to be produced by this uh, drilling uh, activity. And then finally, um, and this is something that typically gets neglected, and that is what are the long-term consequences for economic development uh, in resource extraction industries? What can we expect in the long term? Natural gas drilling is a uh, nat natural resource extraction activity, and therefore it has a boom-bust cycle. Um, it, and that is, there will be um, jobs coming into the region uh, during the boom period. I don't want to pretend that there won't be. There will be act economic activity coming into the region. We can see this. If you drive over the border into Bradford, Pennsylvania, you can see there's traffic, there's trucks, there's businesses starting, there are, are uh, jobs being created there. Uh, uh, but what is that going to look like in 20 years? Uh, that's the question. That's another question we want to answer. And there is some evidence that we can depend on to see what it's going to look like in the long term. Um, so our, our first question that I want to deal with tonight is how do we get a grip on the question the questions of cost to communities and long-term implications? Now, we went around and around about this. And um, what we decided was that the um, most important thing to think about when you're looking at the economic consequences of natural gas drilling is to look at that boom-bust cycle. Because, um, now let's see if I can use this. Um, as I said, uh, there's going to be um, a period where uh, wells are going to be drilled continuously over a period of years. Now, and I, and I want to talk about that period of years because that's a very interesting question. Um, and then, uh, and this is going to happen, this, we could think about this as happening in a region. And so there will be um, investment coming in, there'll be royalties going to, to some landowners, there'll be business incomes, there'll be tax revenues and jobs. Um, and then uh, the wells drilled per year will begin to decline, and then the drilling will end, and then there will be a bust. And the jobs, the drilling jobs will leave the area to go to some other shale play. Um, the businesses that depended on them will have to shut down and there will be a, 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 a bust. And so um, when we look at um, this, we want to look at the economic impact. In part, we want to look at this cycle. And we want to try to understand, for one thing, what the, the, the uh, scale and scope of this and pace of this drilling is going to be. And we also want to understand, um, try to 
try to see what we can say about how long this period is going to last. Now, the Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania made a speech in Pennsylvania a few weeks ago, and he said, in 50 years, Pennsylvania is going to be the Texas of the Northeast. And um, he somehow doesn't seem to understand this boom-bust cycle. <laughs> and he also doesn't seem to understand that the industry, uh, the oil and gas industry, is headquartered in Houston. And so when jobs, and this is particularly true of New York, when the industry expands production in um, the southern tier of New York, what we're going to get are uh, production jobs. We're going to get drilling crews coming from the outside and we're going to get production jobs. The, ge ge the geologist jobs, the fancy consultants, the lawyers, the management personnel, they're going to stay in Houston. They'll probably increase in number in, in Houston. But um, that's because the industry is headquartered there. The oil and gas industry, and this is the only analogy I can give you because this is another industry I study, is like the movie business. So you wouldn't expect that if you made a movie in Binghamton that you were going to turn into Hollywood. And, and the oil and gas industry, or Houston is the Hollywood of the oil and gas industry. So it's the headquarters, they're going to stay there, and that's where most of the employment is going to grow. What we're going to get are the production jobs. So this is what we want to pay attention to. So when we think about this, we want to look at what kinds of factors might affect the pace and scale of Marcellus Shale drilling. There are a number of things that, and, and all of these things, or most of these things, are making for uh, good economics in the Marcellus Shale play. One is transport costs. We used to have to have our natural gas piped up from the Barnett Shale in Texas and um, the Marcellus Shale looks very good because the biggest markets for natural gas are in the east coast of the U.S. So that makes us a prime location. Current tax policy. We all know about the lack of tax policy in Pennsylvania. That uh, is increasing the profit levels of oil and gas companies. If New York doesn't have a tax policy, then uh, we'll look pretty good too to the oil and gas industry. Um, there's also a question of speculative investment um, and I, I am not going to go into that tonight, but um, there's a, there, many of you or some of you may have heard Arthur Berman give a talk in Danby uh, a few weeks ago, and um, he's a geologist and an a investment advisor to the oil and gas industry, to oil and gas industry investors, and he feels that right now the oil and gas industry is um, in the midst of a, the, of a speculative bubble around natural gas because the prices are so low and yet there's a lot of drilling going on. Uh, the economics don't seem to match up with the price of natural gas and so there's a question about why there's so much drilling going on. Um, there's competition among and access to capital by the natural gas companies. Uh, rig availability, there's only so many rigs. This is a very, very expensive speculative business and so um, they're going to allocate rigs uh, to where they can have the best commercial wells, the most profitable wells. Um, regulatory requirements and capacity, uh, regulatory requirements can slow down um, drilling um, and um, as, as can monitoring. So if, if you have lax uh, regulation, um, it, that's going to create uh, an incentive to drill f more quickly. Um, and a decline in other sources. Um, and this is another thing that uh, Arthur Berman has presented, that looking at the Barnett Shale and the Haynesville Shale, um, both of which preceded us, show um, what uh, he's called catastrophic declines after about five years of production. So. One of the things we have to be aware of in looking at pace and scale is that the ramp up may be very fast. There may be lots of wells drilled, speculative wells to keep revenues up, and, and the um, um, 
downturn may come fairly quickly. Um, so this is what this evidence from other shale plays tell us we might be able to anticipate. Possibly a volatile short term seven to ten year, and I'm being generous here, drilling phase, and this is going to move from one locality to another in a region. We have to sort of think about this. It's going to be hot spots, and then the, the drilling will end in one hot spot. It'll move on to another, um, and then there will be, though, a broader regional industrial infrastructure, and this is something we have to think about in Tompkins County because we may not have, see much drilling, but we will be affected by the regional industrial infrastructure. Okay. Um, as I said, we need to see beyond the well pad. Um, so um, if we look at the local costs of shale gas drilling, the kinds of things, these are cumulative costs. These, these are affected by how many d wells are drilled and in what time period. Um, accelerated road maintenance, uh, traffic congestion. The trucks, it, it's, you know, I, I, trucks are not popular in Tompkins County. They're not popular with me. I live on Ithaca Road. Um, uh, <laughs> um, but this is trucks like you've never seen trucks. This is trucks in some places one every minute. So every well pad requires a thousand truck trips right now and there's questions about whether there will be recycling of water so that the number of truck trips will be reduced. Um, but that poses its own problems, and I'm not going to talk about those tonight, but it, it, it's not necessarily the best solution. Um, higher public safety costs. One of the things that happens when you get uh, um, drilling coming into a region is that um, naturally you're going to be, it's going to be like the gold rush. Um, Lots of people are going to come in. You're going to have a population increase. Housing prices are going to rise. There's going to be an increased demand for educational services. There's going to be an increased demand for public and administrative services. Um, and, and an increased demand for police. There has been, uh, that's been demonstrated at least by looking at case studies in different shale plays. Um, so essentially, and this is my take home Mess, uh, message here is that the faster the pace, the higher the cumulative costs. So um, there's an, there are implications here for that. Now, um, then we ask the question is how these local costs are going to be paid. Um, right now in New York, we really don't have a very good idea of how these costs are going to be paid. We've really benefited from the moratorium. I think the moratorium has been great. People have gotten much more educated. They've got, they really know, many people, many more people know what's going on. Um, some counties are taking steps like um, uh, doing uh, baseline studies of their roads so that they can uh, determine the, the, the impact from, from these heavy trucks that are going to be moving along the roads. Um, there's been a lot of activity, but there's still a lot that we don't know uh, how our counties would handle it. Um, and we certainly don't have any state uh, po uh, tax policy to pay for these, um, this kind of damage. There is a property-based severance tax in New York, but, um, and I'm doing some research on this right now, but um, I, I can't see how that property-based severance tax is going to be able to pay for all the demands that are going to be made on local communities. Also, the demands on local communities are going to come before they receive tax revenue. So there's going to be a lag period, as far as we know, because of the way that the taxes are set up. Um, okay, I mentioned this, um, that there's going to be a regional industrial landscape. Now, those of you who um, are in contact with people in Watkins Glen and Schuyler County, know that there's a, a plan there for a, um, a uh, large um, gas storage facility in the salt caverns um, that have been, uh, were owned by U.S. Salt. Um, and um, so there's going to be a, a pipelines linking that, again, trucks, pipelines, all kinds of industrial f facilities that um, 
um, are associated with uh, natural gas drilling. So this is the kind of thing you see. Um, man camps, water evacuation, water extraction sites, compressor plants, which are very noxious, actually, uh, facilities. Um, staging sites, rail spurs, gas storage sites and facilities, processing facilities for produced water, injection wells, um, and we really don't have a plan for dealing with produced water right now. Um, so there may, be have, may have to be facilities constructed for that, and then a lot of trucks. Um, I want to, whoops, am I doing that? Um, I just, th this, is, this is something that struck me as quite poignant, and I'm not going to read it, but I think that one of the things that I've noticed in looking at what happened in Pennsylvania is that people were really not prepared for what was going to happen. They really didn't understand that they were going to have one truck a minute going through their town. I mean, they didn't understand uh, the, the impact on their public safety. They really didn't understand. And, and there, this person wrote, posted after um, an article that shocked some people in Bradford County because it showed that the population um, had actually dropped slightly from 2000 to 2010. That's the resident population. Now they have a huge transient population and they don't understand how the census works. So they didn't realize that those people are, you know, counted as living in Tulsa, not as living in Bradford County, even though they're using Bradford County services. So there's a lot that people simply don't no, they don't know what to expect about this, and that's why I think the moratorium has been valuable. Um, okay, now I just want to finish up here by saying that there is a whole literature in um, planning and development sociology that talks about why, particularly um, rural regions, and that again, we're an urban region here, but places like Schuyler County um, have particularly, um, frequently have poor development outcomes from, from this kind of activity. Um, there are a number of reasons that just make sense. They're not rocket science. The volatile revenue, again, these places get revenue during the boom, but they may use it to cut taxes. And so when the bust comes, they, they've got facilities that they've built to handle more school children and more police, and they don't have the tax base to handle it. It's, you know, classic. And then there's crowding out, which um, is, uh, really refers to um, the fact that um, natural gas drilling or any natural resource extraction industry tends to, to drive up prices, and also because of it's an, in it's an industrial activity, it tends to push out or crowd out other activities that depend on a low cost labor force or that uh, are incompatible with uh, an industrial landscape of the kind I've described. Um, and then, as I said, housing and labor costs rise. Um, and then, again, the reason that they do poorly in many cases is that after that, that boom period, there are actually very few jobs. Um, we have some evidence from, from Chautauqua County, uh, and if you look at even the counties in New York that have had vertical gas drilling, it's a small portion of their, their uh, economy, but they have done worse than the counties nearby. Um, they have some, a few good jobs, they have higher income inequality, um, but they, they have not benefited, I think we could say that clearly. Okay, now this is my last uh, slide here. Okay, this is what I think um, we, how we need to think about this from a policy perspective. Um, slow it down. Slow it down through regulation. Slow it down uh, to, uh, um, by uh, controlling permitting. Slow it down as much as possible to minim minimize those cumulative impacts. We don't want um, thousands of wells in the southern tier of New York in a period of, short period of years. Um, impose severance taxes at the state and local level. I just put this one in because I have just <coughs> reached my limit about the <laughs> anti-tax. 
uh, attitude. Um, also, uh, today I read a, an interesting article about the foreign investors coming into the oil and gas industry, and um, they expect the natural gas from the Marcel Shale to be liquefied and exported. And so we, we are producing natural gas for the world, and if we're going to do that, we need to tax it. Um, this is very important, be transparent. I think Pennsylvania has done a decent job of being transparent about where the drilling is occurring, where incidents are occurring, but I think this, could, this is absolutely critical if people are going to have any confidence in, in the government uh, regulation of this. Um, plan across governments to minimize negative impacts. Now, as I said, this act, these activities are going to go in these hot spots. These hot spots are not necessarily going to be uh, coterminous with jurisdictional boundaries. We may have a hot spot between Tompkins and Schuyler County, um, and uh, we, and then, or, or a hot spot in Schuyler County, and then we're affected by the industrial infrastructure. So there's a need for cross-governmental uh, cooperation, and then be proactive in planning for ways to use this resource. And th what I mean is. I think that we should see this as a resource, as a, 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 a resource that is um, finite, and, but it is a resource, and, and we could potentially use it for um, district heating, for building some new industries in New York, um, for, for doing things where we could actually derive some benefit from having this asset instead of putting it into pipes and shipping it to Philadelphia and New York. Um, so um, I think that that is a, that's sort of a very hopeful idea uh, about this, but I think it's an important thing also to think about it as, as an asset, as something positive. I think the, uh, the first principle of this obviously is that when it's gone, it's gone. So. We need to think very seriously about that boom-bust cycle and about what the implications are when we make uh, economic decisions. So I will now quit and we can turn to the next speaker. Professor Silsby is firing up the slides. <clears throat> I want to start with a story, uh, one that I heard a couple of years ago at meetings that I went to on hydraulic fracturing. The discussion turned to, um, well, if we got rid of the leases, we'd be all right. And the way to get rid of the leases is for the people who got signing bonuses to simply give the bonuses back, and that would end it. Uh, I want to relate a story that I think has the best answer that I've heard and it really bears on what we're doing. One of the organizers said, I've just talked to a man, a, a father, who had just got his signing bonus check. And the father said, I've been able to take my children to the dentist for the first time in their lives. That lays out a dimension of what we're dealing with. I'd like to thank the League for inviting me here. I am a retired physics professor at Ithaca College. I will assure you that nothing I say has anything to do with physics, sort of. I think the only connection is that by training physicists, and there are a few in the room, uh, look at numbers and ask, what's the story here? What's the story that these numbers are telling? And that's what I'm going to try and do. There's the, there are, our Marcella Shale, the picture that we've seen. Um, I'm, first thing I'm going to look at is, is uh, income from the Marcella Shale and income from the other things that require clean water, and we'll compare those. 
I'm going to do a couple of things along the way, and I'll point them out when they happen, is I would like to try and shift the focus a little bit. I'll let you know what that shift will be when, when I get to that point. But there's the data that I used, uh, about 50 trillion cubic feet. That was an estimate that came out. About a quarter of it's in New York State. Uh, the market value is currently is about $4 a thousand cubic feet in this country. In Europe, it's 10. That's an important distinction because <laughs> the number that is quoted is you need to have seven or eight in order to make money drilling over the horizontal fracturing. Um, I looked only at the royalties and I picked a 12 and a half percent and I'll talk about that in a minute. I picked a 20 year lifetime because that's what seemed to be in the literature. Uh, in a sense that scales because all of the numbers were multiplied the yearly value by 20 to get it. And I get a projected income of about $6.6 billion, $6 billion. When I first did this graph about two years ago, the price was then about $14 uh, a thousand cubic feet. And so the number that I posted then was a whole lot bigger than it is now. Oh, oh, let's back up. Tourism is important in the state and it, fresh water attracts it. I estimated, I asked about $27 billion over 20 years. And by the way, I have some references if people would like them. I have a limited number and I'll make them available for people afterwards. And if you'd like, you can contact me and find out where these numbers come from. Uh, about $27 billion over 20 years. And this is for tourism, uh, grapes and uh, winemaking. About $68 billion over 20 years. Those of you in the back, I apologize that about it's a little low, but you begin to see on the right hand side the bar graph growing as to the income that we are currently receiving that depends on clean water. Farm cash receipts, about $48 billion over 20 years. Dairy, different, and I think it is different in the way they're reported, about $39 billion over 20 years, and the bar graph grows. Hunting and fishing in the Marcellus counties. These numbers, by the way, are only for the counties under which Marcellus Shale lies. Not the whole state, just the Marcellus Shale counties. Hunting and fishing estimated at $40 billion over 20 years. Um, wildlife watching, about $32 billion over 20 years. That was a number that really surprised me. Are there other things that come out of, fresh, uh, out of uh, the need for natural clean water? Sure. But when I looked at this graph, I said, I think I know something. <laughs> I think I know something. The projected gas income is about $6.6 .6 billion. It used to be 20 when the price was up. 3% of that current income is $8 billion. A loss of 3% in the current income would wipe out the projected income from royalties on natural gas. Now, Oh, translations happened. This was done on a Mac and, and it with a trend. Anyway, there are some things I've been left out and so I want to be very clear about it. Um, I've left off signing bonuses. One of the reasons I left them out is I haven't any clue what they are. I know people who got $30 an acre way back when. And I know of people who got $3,000 an acre. I have no idea what the signing bonuses really are. Um, there are taxes to local communities that don't have that number either. Increase in potential local jobs. We'll come back to that in a minute. That I think I have some information on. Quality of life, improve or not? That's an open question. On the current income side, I left out the value of clean drinking water. One way of I thought of doing it was to use New York City's estimate of the cost to filter their water if fracturing was allowed in those counties and then get that on a per gallon basis. But I thought, no, that's a little bit iffy. Clean water from other sources. There are other things that depend upon clean water. Uh, in order, the, the Omega Gang Brewery over here decided that they were opposed to hydraulic fracturing because of the threat to the wa their water supply they need for their beer. Quality of life can go either way. From where I, the, I think the story these numbers are telling is it's unlikely that what's been left out would make these 
two bar graphs comparable, the risk remains. Small changes in current income from loss of potable water could seriously damage the income, remove the income from gastrolink. Well, what about jobs? This one comes from um, an Energy West, Headwaters Economics in out in Bozeman, Montana. Um, they looked at jobs in what they call two energy focusing counties, that what, ones that produce coal, oil, and natural gas. Those are the yellow ones. The blue ones are similar ones. There are 26 energy focusing countries, counties and 254 similar ones. And they, they compared these two. And this is what they found. In the energy focusing counties, those that had income from coal mining, oil wells, natural gas wells. The le was less economic diversity and resilience. The levels were of education and the workforce were lower. There was a greater gap between high and low income households. A growing wage disparity between energy related workers and all other workers. And less ability to attract investment in retirement dollars. That's what they found on a 1970 to 2005 study of those counties out west. There's the boom bust cycle that Professor Christopherson referred to as it occurred out there from 1970 to 2005. You see the solid blue line is the gas related companies. You see it rise and then fall. Uh, there was another energy boom, as it were, in the 1900s to 2000. But it didn't come back out there. You'll notice that the blue line is below the dotted line. The dotted line is from those counties which did not depend upon drill, extraction of gas, coal, and oil. If you look at the growth in income from those counties which don't depend upon that extraction process and those that do, you find that those counties, the non-energy focusing ones, the blue one on top, is their uh, percent the growth of, of income and it starts out that they make more income per person than per capita than the other comp the, the drilling counties and that gap grows it starts at about seven hundred dollars and ends up at about eighteen hundred dollars at the end of the study well that's for oil gas and coal out west what about around here I've turned to uh, a study by uh, uh, Dr. Jeanette Barth, J.M. Barth Associates. Uh, it, the title is in, entitled Unanswered Questions About the Economic Impact of Gas Drilling in the Marcella <coughs> Shale. Don't jump to conclusions. And it came out fairly recently. And there's what she found. The blue colors are the gas drilling counties, 10 gas drilling counties out west. These are the vertical wells, not hydraulic, the horizontal hydraulic fracturing. And there are five neighbors. And there are the measures of income that she used. She looked at the left, the percentage below poverty, the, at the, uh, below the poverty line, and they're about the same. She, next, the next is the percent unemployment, they're about the same. The gas drilling companies, in fact, had a little slightly higher unemployment. The third bar graphs are the median income in the gas drilling and non gas drilling counties, and they're virtually the same. The last column is, the last bars are the per capita income, and the gas drilling counties are slightly higher in per capita, but essentially the same. What the study, the, the numbers I think say is that in western New York, the uh, drilling did not produce an increase in the income of people who live there. Well, what about Pennsylvania, where there is fracturing going on, has been for uh, some years. This study, uh, this also comes from uh, Dr. Barth's work. She looked at the oil and gas employment and the maximum value um, a number of people employed in the year of 2004 was about 2,700 in the, in the uh, in people in Pennsylvania who were employed. In 2010, there were almost 49,000 people employed by Walmart. 
and about 400,000 people employed in the tourist industry. There were more jobs created in Pennsylvania. This, and I, I think she used uh, the um, census numbers here, but not a lot. This is a shift I want to make. I want to move from jobs and dollars to valuing things on other measures. And of the measure I want to use is water. What kind of water use is, will come with drilling? And what else could we do with that water? What is its value beyond producing natural gas? So it's competition. There is uses for water. Some of them return the water to the hydrological cycle. This is something which sort of hit me between the eyes about a month and a half ago. Tourism, hunting and fishing, agriculture, homeowners and businesses. We use water, it goes through some kind of a process, whether it's a treatment plant or it just flows downstream and, and goes and plants and, and sort it out. The, the water is not removed from the hydrological cycle. And that's what I've been thinking about. And all of a sudden it occurred to me that with fracking, it is removed from the hydrological cycle, and we'll get back to that. It's water that is taken out, and we'll see it turns out to be a lot of water. Ballpark, it takes about 5 million gallons of clean water to fracture a well. Some, perhaps 20% of it, returns quickly to the surface, and it's contaminated. And some, perhaps 80%, remains underground forever say the drilling companies, that's when they tell us that there's no way that fracturing which takes place thousands of feet underground could ever affect drinking water, what they're saying is that water stays there forever. It's another way of looking at what they're saying. I'm going to use this 20-80% ratio in the examples I'm working with. The numbers, these are estimates, this whole thing are estimates. But these numbers of estimates, I've seen uh, reports where the claims no water returns and reports where the claim is half of it returns. These are the numbers which I've seen fairly recently. If it takes five million gallons of water to clean, to fracture a well, what else could we do with it? We could satisfy Ithaca's freshwater needs for two days. We're about 3.3 million gallons a day. We could produce grapes for 14,000 bottles of wine. We could produce 3,000 gallons of milk, 2,000 bushels of corn, or about 22 tons of wheat. Those are other things we could do with 5 million gallons. That's a lot of water, yes? That's just one well. That's just one well. Here are some examples of contaminants. And let me just check, because I just want to make sure I didn't jump things here too quickly. That's, that's good. Added chemicals to aid the fracturing process, typically ethylene glycol. Returned material from the, the drilling process includes heavy metals, includes radioactive metals, includes, but it also includes salt. And I've used uh, well, salt, and we'll look at some numbers and see what happens. If 20% returns, that's that number of the estimate I'm using, we're talking about 1 million gallons of water for every well that's fractured. And I'll use that number to work my way through these estimates. They are estimates. I think if we change that number, and I'm not sure what uh, the better one to use, uh, it won't change the end result a whole lot. Typically, uh, you return 6,000 parts per million ethylene glycol and uh, 10,000 parts per million of salts of various kinds. EPA drinking water standards, ethylene glycol are 14 parts per million. New Hampshire says seven. Okay, F, uh, EPA says seven, 14. 600 divided by 14 is about 43. Means we've got to dilute that 1 million gallons by 43 fold in order to make it meet the EPA. That's 43 million gallons uh, of wa fresh water. Eight times the amount that was used to fracture the well to begin with. At 10,000 parts per million of salt, the drinking water standard is about 100 parts per million, so we have to dilute this by a factor of 100. That 1 million gallons that comes back, an estimate, would require 100 million gallons of fresh water to make it 
meet the standards. 20 times the amount to fracture the well, and that's just one well. Dilution is not a solution to this pollution. <laughs> there are projected 4,000 wells in Tompkins County, each requiring an average of 5 million gallons. That's 20 billion gallons of water to frack Tompkins County. This comes from the Ithaca Tompkins County Transport. And uh, one of the numbers that caught my attention um, since I live out near Richford is the projection of truck traffic. They, they estimate truck traffic down various roads, and they've estimated the truck traffic down Route 79, which goes through downtown Richford. An increase of 6,000 trucks per day. That's four trucks a minute. That sounds outrageous, but if you listen to people who've been down and into Pennsylvania where the trucking fracking is going on, they report a truck going by every 10 to 20 seconds. The number sounds outrageous, but unfortunately, well, what else could you do with 20 billion gallons of clean water in Tompkins County? We could supply the city of Ithaca for 18 years. We could create a lake one mile on a side. That's about the size of downtown Ithaca, 106 feet deep. It's a lot of water. That's just Tompkins County. We could produce 3.2 million bushels of corn. What I'm doing is suggesting rather than dollars and jobs, as important as they are, we look at other costs and see what those costs are, and they're a little different, a different measure, and I think in a, it sheds a different light on things. Clean water can be used by, for a number of things. We make choices about which to use. There are other non-fossil fuel energy sources. And here's one of the things that caught my attention, and maybe it'll catch yours too. Put at the top of the list, conservation. And as I thought about this, it occurs to me that conservation produces energy whose production costs have already been paid. Now, what sounds strange? Now, let's suppose that each of you out there, and I would love to do this, could save 100 gallons of gasoline in a year's time. That's good, right? That's 400 bucks. But that's gasoline that's already produced. That's gasoline, the cost of the environment has already been paid. That's gasoline, the dollars costs have already been paid. It's sitting there in the tank for somebody else to use. Conservation produces energy. A strange point of view, but I think it's one that can be helpful as we think about how we're going to deal with our circumstances. And then, of course, there's the standards, solar, wind, hydroelectric, tidal, and more. There are other non-energy producing, non-fossil fuel sources of energy. For example, electricity from the renewable resources. There's a map of the United States. The dark green are those states which produce, uh, can produce 100% or more of the energy that they, the, the electricity they use from, res, from uh, renewable resources. And when I mean more than 100%, I mean like Minnesota's 1,000%. I mean, we're talking significantly more. Even New York State, cloudy Ithaca, we could produce 80% of the electrical energy we need from renewable resources. Trivial? No. Doable? I think it raises some interesting questions. In making choices, dollars can help inform our thinking. However, I think the underlying issue, and this isn't unique to me, this, this I picked up from reading somebody else. The question is, what do we value? What do we think most important? How do we deal with the costs of the choices we make? And that brings me back to that father who said, with his signing bonus. Now I can take my children to the dentist for the first time in their lives. 
Thank you. How do I advance this? Uh, simplest thing is space bar. If you want to go back, uh, you know, delete. Okay. Great. Okay, I've got my instructions on how to use the computer, so I'm ready. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this event. And I want to thank my co-presenters for giving us more to think about. And I want to thank all of you for taking time from whatever else you had on your plate for the day to show up here and, uh, take, and take this time to think about our future. So like um, John, I'm not an economist, so the question is why am I up here? And I guess it's because I, take, I am involved in local government, and I take the role of local government officials to learn about um, issues around them, and natural gas is, of course, and the exploration is one of those issues to help prepare my town of Caroline and the Tompkins County Council of Governments for those issues. So I've been to Pennsylvania actually several times, and uh, I feel like uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, who went to sleep and saw Christmas future. It's a real opportunity to see your future before it actually occur occurs. And when I've been to Pennsylvania, the officials there have told us in New York that we have an unbelievable opportunity that they did not have. We have the opportunity to look to see, and to plan. So there are many facets of shale gas extraction, and our other presenters have talked about some of those, and that's not really our focus tonight. It is to talk about eco the economics. And many of you have, may have uh, seen the Time magazine uh, recently has uh, the shale gas, the gas dilemma. And in it, there are a couple of anecdotal stories. Um, first one comes from a gentleman who uh, lost a gas station and a fuel support outfit. He did well, but his business really took off in 2008 when gas drilling companies, eager for the region's natural gas, began setting up shop. He's added dozens of employees. In addition, like other landowners around the region, he has sold a gas company the rights to drill on his land. There's a well not far from his front door. I could never dream I was going to be able to grow this big. I've been, I've been a blessed person because of all of this. And another anecdotal story has a guy sitting, uh, standing in front of his uh, brand new Cadillac, all shiny in the sun with a hotel going up behind him. And he says, it's been wonderful that these businesses have come into the area. We're not being impacted by the recession at all. He has two hotels in the middle of gas country that are full of drillers. He's building another unit. And he's had a dozen new employees. And yet one more anecdotal story um, where they say jobs are up, but some businesses have suffered as employees have fled for higher paying jobs in the gas industry. His rig workers have sapped up every available room in tiny towns. Rents have skyrocketed, pushing low income families who don't own their homes. So what do we make of these anecdotal stories and how do we deal with that? Uh, what I've done is I've actually attended a number of presentations and one is by Jeanette Barth, who uh, John had uh, mentioned. Another is by our own Jeffrey Jaquette from uh, Cornell University, who uh, also worked at Penn State. And he did work uh, called Energy, Energy Boom Towns and Natural Gas. And uh, the, the work I'll, be, oh, I'll talk about, Jeanette, in just a minute. And then also I have a few slides from a gentleman whose name is Chip Northrup, who as a former ARCO, executive and has some very strong opinions about the gas industry as he's taken up a residence in uh, Cooperstown and uh, right on a very beautiful lake. What I'd like to do is weave uh, my comments uh, and their stories together. So there are a few uh, background concepts 
the scale, as we've all come to appreciate of this, is big with over a trillion uh, dollars in recoverable gas in New York. It's a non-renewable resource-based capital-intensive economic development. And by non-renewable, that also means in code, uh, not sustainable. And as uh, Susan said, when it's gone, it's gone. So there are direct economic impacts that we're gonna talk about and have heard earlier. There are local economic impacts and multiplier effects and there are haves and have-nots. And this is uh, the words of Alan Kruger. He says, the oil and gas industry is about 10 times more capital intensive than the US economy as a whole. So we're talking about a lot of machines and not a lot of people. This is from Jeanette Barr's um, Marcella Shale Economic Impact Study. And she says, in light of the undisputed potential of economic harm from gas drilling in the Marcella Shale, the principal reason advanced for taking the environmental risk is the positive economic impact that such drilling could have in New York State and its counties. So to that point, um, Chip Northrup says, most suppliers actually come from out of state. The capital intensive, it is capital intensive, yet most of the costs for the wells, the drilling rigs, the pipes, the fracking fluids are all produced outside of New York State. These firms will probably not locate in New York State and pay New York State taxes. So the sales tax are all booked outside of New York State. And then Barth um, just lets us know what the draft supplemental, G, D, draft supplemental GEIS says about in the economic section. It says, from a 1998 DEC report, the reported earnings multiplier of 1.4 for the oil and gas industry in New York State is lower than many other manufacturing and service industries, partly because the industry on a whole is not labor intensive, and also because most of the companies which provide services to the industry are not headquartered in New York, but outside of New York. So this is uh, in our own draft supplemental GEIS. So our friend um, Chip Northrup responds that the Multiplier effect is actually a hoax. And when we look through the literature, most of the multiplier effects are actually quoted to be around 1.2. But Chip says that 80% of the money leaves the state. So the multiplier effect is 20% on what is left. And he makes the point, who cares what the coefficient is when there's so little money staying in the state from a, such a big industry. So Barth points out that in the Broome County uh, Economic Development Plan of 2001, it shows that the multiplier effect of agriculture is 2.28. And the study concludes that farming should be encouraged for economic development of that county. Anybody who's seen information coming from um, Broome County would wonder if they've read that report recently. <laughs> um, actually, Susan showed this graph, but I have a little bit more to add to it. Um, the money from uh, the multiplier effect chart, uh, this is actually comes from, I have a different logo down in, in the right hand corner. This is from um, Tim Kelsey who presented with uh, Jeffrey Jaquette not too long ago in Watkins Glen. And this is direct revenue from resource, uh, from gas wells. And you notice when they stop drilling that the uh, revenue drops off sh sharply. And that is a function of shale gas. Gas that comes from pockets that are sandstone or limestone actually peak out about five years after they've been drilled. But for shale gas, uh, once it's been fracked, it drops off precipitously. And so that's what you're seeing here. As long as the wells are being drilled, there's a lot of uh, revenue coming, uh, being produced. But once it stops, um, once you stop drilling, the revenue drops off very quickly. So this sounds like kind of a mixed bag of economic impacts. And what can we learn from all this? Uh, this is where Jeffrey Jaquette comes in on his uh, analysis he had done in 2009, looking at past research on, on boom towns and natural gas. And these are boom towns from the 70s and 80s. He found that economic impacts can be mixed and not uniform, that inflation, inflation accompanies economic growth, and Susan had talked about this, that job growth is stratified, was skilled or transient, and bus cycles always follow. This is a summary of Susan's remarks. He goes on to say that there are three phases of gas 
uh, extraction. And first is the development phase, which uh, we've heard so much about in Pennsylvania. Of course, there's the well pad and the road construction. So uh, pipeline construction. There's the drilling of the well and the fracking of the well. And all these activities uh, add to the traffic and uh, damage to the roads. And then there also is reclaiming that takes place after some of the uh, after some of the drilling has taken place. And then we get into the production phase, which is longer lived uh, and has a smaller and steady labor force. So there's trucking away of the waste that's produced from the well. There's uh, monitoring production and the occasional work uh, workovers of, of the site. And then the, finally, there's the reclamation phase. And Jeffrey goes on to say that his research found that there are five assumptions that people have about energy development, and I'm sure that many of us have held these as well. One is that rural residents will desire positions in the new industry. A large number of locals will apply for the available jobs. Local ac applicants will possess the requisite job skills. The industry will, is willing and able to hire a substantial portion of the local applicants. And finally, current unemployed, unemployed residents will desire, seek, and obtain jobs with a greater frequency than those already employed. But after he finishes his work, he concludes, it is often the case that some, if not all, of these assumptions do not actually occur. Give an idea of the labor requirements. We talked about the different phases. So uh, during each, the drilling of each Marcellus well, this is each well, requires more than 420 individuals across 150 different disciplines or occupations, translate in, into nearly 13 full-time direct jobs per well. But once drilled, every 100 wells generates 18 long-term full-time jobs. And then there are also indirect unemployment, excuse me, employment impacts that come from this. Oh, going back. So uh, this is um, some work that's uh, an actual uh, study that was done on the Jonah and our anticline um, fields in Wyoming. And the red shows the development phase with all the activity and the number of jobs that were produced. And then you see on top of that, you start to see the production uh, blue show up. And then after we've gone out for a bit of time, then there's a few jobs left with the reclamation in green. So you can see the huge impact of production and once the, uh, of the development of the wells. And once the development is done, then we are left with uh, very few jobs. So how does this affect existing businesses? This is more work from Jeffrey Jaquette. Local businesses often, uh, often receive greater sales activities. They often are shifting their service focus to the gas industry. Proprietors also have to fight high inflation rates, worker shortages, and changing ways of doing business. And these changes will result in greater rate of turnover among ownership and increased incentive to sell to outside interest. The research has found that the rate of failure among small businesses in boom towns is, about, is above the national average. And finally, the level of industrialization between the wells drilled historically in the, Mar in the region and Marcellus Shale wells in many, is many levels of magnitude larger as the Marcellus wells require significantly longer drilling times, larger drilling rigs, hydrofracking, larger workforces, and more advanced production equipment. Many residents may expect the Marcellus development to resemble the relatively quick and easy drilling practices of earlier in the shallower fields. So he concludes his work by saying that gas development can be a two-edged sword. Experience in other states suggests major impacts on existing businesses and employees with very high wages in the industry, raising wages in other sectors. And the cost can be very high cost of living with inflation rates higher than the national average and average rentals increases, increase due to the rental rates increase due to the housing demand. And that the non-gas field businesses and residents can struggle as they lose employees to the gas industry and commercial space can become very expensive. When I was meeting with uh, some local officials in Pennsylvania, they all mentioned that the bulk of their staff had left to take uh, jobs with the gas industry. 
And so, uh, along with Jeffrey Chiquette at uh, in Watkins Glen a, a month ago was Tim Kelsey, who presented this slide uh, with work that he had done on impacts of ty on type of businesses in 2010. So he looks at the type of business, the effect on their activity and sales, and you can see that uh, business had changed for uh, most of them, and also their, the sales increase for most of them as well. So that there's uh, definitely, there are impacts on the type of business. One measure of business activity, of course, is traffic, and all of our previous presenters have talked about this as well. So you will see in the green and blue colors, the five-year average for um, four spaces in Bradford County that have traffic count data. And then you will see that the uh, green and for the five year is truck traffic and the red for the five year, for the 2010 only, is truck traffic. And then for all vehicles, it goes from the blue to the black. So there's a huge increase in traffic and uh, this is verified by actual traffic counts within that county. So my friend uh, Chip Northrup is very blunt he says New York is, will be exploited by the oil and gas industry. 90% of the value of the well and the gas goes out of the state. And the state without severance tax, which we currently do not have, gets no revenue. And local, govern, local governments get very little revenue, and I'll talk about, more about that in just a second. And there are few local jobs or suppliers. As this is a capital intensive business and most of the supplies they need are not produced in New York State. He goes on to say the most value leaves the state tax-free. So the money goes out of state for these uh, for, to the out-of-state suppliers and also out-of-state producers avoid New York State income tax. So the sales are booked out of state and intercompany transfers of gas to a lower tax state may occur. However, as long as we don't have severance tax, we will be that lower tax state. So the inability to capture property value, um, it was mentioned earlier that local governments actually have an opportunity to get, to, uh, get some ad valorem or what we call property taxes from a gas well. And there are taxes based on the actual structures, but there also is a tax on the, um, on the gas itself. The current formula that's used is based on uh, Trenton Black and other limestone and sandstone pocket wells, which produced, which produced their peak amount in year five. So whenever, if you remember the decline curve, you saw how fast the gas was uh, depleting once it's been fracked. 75% uh, of the value of the gas has gone the first year, and we won't be recognizing its actual production until year five. So we've missed most, most of the uh, value of the gas because of the current formula that New York State requires us to use. And to make it even more curious, the producers self-report their production, and I just happen to be a property taxpayer, I would love to let the assessment office know how much my property is worth, but um, <laughs> I don't get that choice, but the, for some reason the gas and oil industry does. And because there's no severance tax in New York State, there's no monitoring by the state, so there's no meters that are being read by anyone other than the gas industry. And another little side light is that information is not available by FOIL and cannot be accessed by local officials. So Chip Northrop says that New York gets 100% of the cleanup cost because we have very little revenue and lacks or no regulatory oversight. So New York, gets, New York State gets no money. New York State has no frac waste disposal wells, which is the cheapest way to get rid of it. The industry is self-regulated. The DEC has no funds or staff to deal with the shale gas, and the EPA has no control over frackers. So this is a, another statement uh, that Barth reports from the, 2019, from the uh, draft supplemental, and it's again referring to the 1988 gas economics. And it says, unfortunately, it is difficult to assign precise monetary values to aesthetic benefits, such as the beauty of unspoiled wilderness. The, mile, the monetary value for improvements in such areas as clean water, clean air, and the parameter and clean soil are easy to estimate and assign by using parameters such as increased property value, decreased 
health care costs, increase recreational and tourist use, and improve production for forestry, fishery, and agriculture. The report even goes on to state that most experts in this field agree that in most cases it's much cheaper to prevent pollution than to restore environment after it has occurred, which is very curious for anyone who has read the draft supplemental that they would make that statement. And so um, a, a, a uh, chairman of the uh, Board of uh, County Commissioners, which would be like the chairman of the Board of, uh, of uh, Representatives in uh, County Legislature in Tompkins County, and made this statement after the Leroy uh, gas well blew out um, a little over a week ago. And part of his, this is he making the statement to the governor. He says, the Marcellus Shale with the environmental damage that has become an everyday reality in Bradford County. I continue to see our counties, townships, and boroughs struggle with the complex issues of development with no financial or logistical support. Sounds probably very familiar to those of us who've been hearing the story about uh, property tax caps and the state budget. He says, I have heard politicians in complete favor of the gas industry use this phrase, we don't want to kill the golden goose. Well, I would like to state for the record that the golden goose does not exist. It's no more a part of reality than the tooth fairy, Santa Claus, or the Easter bunny. This is someone who's dealing with it every day, and this is how frustrated he is with the lack of preparation that has taken place in his county and his state. And so brings me to my final slide, which is, how do we prepare for this? And what planning can we do to be proactive? And there are three things that I will suggest here. Focus our needs has to be on the future, after the boom, and not the present or during the boom. We must view Marcellus as a potential means to improve the economy, social organization, and human capital, physical and infrastructure. Gas extraction by itself is not an end. And finally, we need public engagement, social networks, collaboration, and communication to address the long run and how Marcellus fits in. This is real hard work, and it will require the combined energy and wisdom of the uh, local governments, the League of Women Voters, the citizens, and the business community. I thank you. Simple question is: uh, Is this material available on a website or listserv, so that the people who are not here at this meeting we can disseminate it out to them? Well, we we are filming this, and that we're, that's going to be up on a website. I don't know exactly how soon. But you know, on a website, do you have the information? The League of Women Voters website. website. Okay, thank you. It's it's the League of Women Voters. Uh, it's lwvtompkins.org. Question for Mr. Barber. <clears throat> I believe you said that the main motivation for taking the risk is the possible eco desirable economic impact. Um, there's another aspect, and that is the effect on the environment. And the question of whether the use of natural gas 
is much kinder in terms of greenhouse gas emissions than coal, and couldn't we, can we replace the use of coal that way? There is some controversy at the moment concerning that, but suppose the controversy ends up being settled that get natural gas is cons produces much uh, significantly less greenhouse gas emissions than coal. How would you then respond to the assertion that the main motivation for taking the risk is to our concern with the <clears throat> welfare of our planet? How about now? OK. So anyways, let's start again. Um, Jeanette Barth actually made the statement rather than myself, but I would be more than happy to respond. To the question being, um, is fossil fuel our energy choice for the future? Fossil fuel is controlled by multinational corporations, and they control our economy. There are fuel sources that are available to everyone, rich and poor alike. They happen to come from the sun, the wind, the earth, and gravity. Whenever we choose to use that as our economic base and our energy base, we will rid ourselves of the huge mantle that we carry around on our shoulders from the oil and gas industry. a question. I'm not sure who it's for. Probably for um, Professor Christofferson. Um, you made this, the recommendation, I've heard this before, that um, the way to approach gas development is to slow down. But a certain amount of infrastructure is necessary to develop the gas. And it seems to me that um, those two statements might be at cross purposes in order for the gas to be developed, a certain amount of infrastructure is necessary. And in order to finance the infrastructure, a certain amount of gas development is necessary. So do you think that the industry could realistically come in at a, at a slow pace? Or is it a given that if they're going to come in at all, it would have to be at a much larger, on a much larger scale in order to justify the construction of all this infrastructure? That's my first question, anyway. Uh, I, uh, I think that's an interesting question. I think that a certain amount of in infrastructure probably is necessary. It's being constructed right now. Uh, and, and actually, the southern tier of New York is already being affected by drilling in northern Pennsylvania. There's no, we're part of this now. Um, I think that um, m my concern is that the damage to the environment and to local economies uh, from accelerated drilling, especially risky speculative accelerated drilling, is, is such that um, s slowing it down um, will um, uh, um, allow communities to adapt uh, to the to the process and and will um, mitigate the the damage. A, a lot of the damage comes from that fast ramp up. So if it's it's slower, it will it will ameliorate it, um, and um, it, and the gas will still be there. The gas isn't going to go away. So um, I, I take your point, and I think it's a good point. Um, but I, I would rather uh, through permitting, for example. Um, slow the whole process down and also allow us, I don't think New York is ready for natural gas drilling, for, for high volume hydraulic fracturing, for all the reasons we've heard. I just don't think that we're ready. And so I think we need to have better policies, taxes, other things in place. Well, I guess it sort of answers the question, but not quite. But I guess my second 30 second question is just, um, it was mentioned that we, if we have this development, that it should be used for our economic benefit, but I don't understand how that is possible. Um, I think this gentleman um, um, has has that as a a goal. The the town uh, of Caroline has been um, looking at uh, the whole question of distributed energy. 
Um, I disagree with Don to some extent because I've had uh, students do research on wind power. Wind power is also owned by multinational corporations. It's, there's industrial wind power and it is not good. It's not good for the environment, it's not good for communities. Um, so I think that the experiments that are being done with, um, with if, by communities who want to get off the grid, who want to um, experiment with uh, district heating, with uh, local alternatives, whether it's wind or solar or, or even natural gas, um, it has its benefits from an economic perspective in the sense that it creates independence from, from people who, and corporations that are driving this agenda. <laughs> I understand, in fact I know that there is another fracking technique that has it all over hydro fracking. Could each of the speakers compare this new technology to the outmoded technology of hydrofracking with respect to the following? Radiation and salt, pond uh, overflow, water pollution, the safety of the propent, the massive truck hauling, water subtraction, the, reflect, the, relate, the relative productivity of the well, and the damage to the well so that 10 or 20 years from now, when the Canadians invent a technique for secondary recovery, it will be possible. Can you tell me what that technique is? I'm amazed that you don't know. How could you take the stand without not knowing? Is there a question? Well, you, you're talking about using propane? It was in the Ithaca Journal. There were advertisements for yes. two talks. 500 people came to those talks. I'm sure the people uh, around the city talked about them a lot. It was on the radio, the He's advertisements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's fully aware of that. Who is? All I these mean, people are. We all are. It's just, it's, <laughs> well, it, it's completely relevant because why should we approve a technique that is, uh, outdated when there is a technique that solves all the problems you talked about. Economically solves those problems. Could I try just a short answer to that? We're on. Could I try just a quick answer to that? The gel is propane at pressures that are above its critical point, so it's not a gel like jello, it's not like custard, it's a fluid, it flows. Propane is explosive. Propane tanks at houses and in gas stations and your grills are in the out, kept outdoors, and that's for a very good reason. They leak. Propane is heavier than air. It will settle in low places. If there's a wind, it will blow it away. If it's still, it will settle in low places and the propane will flow like water until it reach a, reaches a combustion source. There are th this, this comes from Professor Ingraffi. He said there are thousands of joints, valves, pressure gauges, and a, and a wellhead. All of them can leak. The fracking fluid that is being proposed is propane. Leaks of propane are much more, potentially much more serious than leaks of water. I'm not convinced, and I've just begun to look at, look at it, but I'm not convinced that propane is an improvement as a fracking fluid. I'd like to reply briefly if I could. I'm sorry, but we do have other people here that have questions and we'll have to, you know. No, when I hear falsehoods, uh, they they need reply. Uh, propane is a hydrocarbon. So is methane. Methane is much more explosive than propane. That's why you use propane in the tank outside of your cooking unit, your outside cooking unit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, the key word is outside. Pro, my propane tank is outside my house. 
the local law wouldn't let me put it in where I foolish enough to want to do so. Can I, can I, I think just take one uh, stab at the economic uh, question that was actually asked. And what we're dealing with, um, in order, shale is um, a monolithic surface. It's like the concrete floor that we're standing on. And so we have to break that up in order to get the gas out. And you have to put wells down on a fairly regular basis in order for that to happen. And so the economic impact of creating a lot of wells has not changed by the fact that you've changed the fluid that you're going to use. You still need to have a lot of wells placed next to houses, in rural areas, in urban areas, in order to, to, in order to get to this gas. So some of the uh, ch changes in the number of truck trips may be different, but um, the number of wells and the impacts on the rural landscape will not be changed. My name is Stephen Emlin, and I heard about severance tax from each of you, I think, mentioned it. Um, I know very little about severance tax. Is, is this something which other states have and is something that uh, could be done? Is, are there moves at the moment to sort of uh, impose that here in New York State in order to capture some of this economic or at least pay for the damages being done? My understanding is that New York and Pennsylvania are these among the few states that have no severance tax. I looked it up on Google, which is one has to understand the limits of that. The word severance me comes from severing, removing a natural resource, something of value from the ground. And so the tax is, would be on removing something of value, natural gas in this case, from our community. And we don't have one. Are there moves afoot in the state assembly and senate to, to, to work on this? Yes. Okay. Good. Can I just add yes. something to that, too? I think that when we enact a severance tax, if we do, um, uh, we have to look at the, the tax that's uh, enacted and at the effective tax. Many states have so many loopholes in their severance taxes that the effective tax rate is next to nothing. This is true, I think, in Colorado. So this is another reason for needing transparency when these, like when the tax uh, provisions are decided. We need to know what the loopholes are because we can have a, it's like the corporate income tax, which is is 35%, but the effective tax is 20%, and General Electric pays 3%. So uh, the same thing applies to severance taxes. We have to know exactly what the effective tax is. I have a, a two-part question. Um, one is kind of a rephrase of an earlier question. So, uh, Dr. Christopherson, I think that implicit in what you've done with the broom and bust phase stuff is to imply that too much growth is actually a bad thing. You know, we're accustomed to thinking that growth is good, but too rapid of growth leads to strains and problems. So I guess my question is, uh, what is in the economic thinking sort of a reasonable growth rate that is sustainable that doesn't cause more damage than good? And then the other uh, points for both Dr. Schwartz and, and Dr. Christopherson, um, you know, you, you point out that the, it's modeling that shows all these great economic benefits. Then when one goes out and looks in the real world, as is in the Headwater study and elsewhere, uh, and I'm sure you're, you're aware of the, the work by Dr. Freudenberg, often we find negative impacts due to resource extraction. The criticism I've heard about applying the Headwaters to New York State is that that's federal land out here, and here it's private land, and so it doesn't translate quite the same way. So I'm interested in hearing um, from this panel of experts, what they would have to say about the applicability of the Headwaters work uh, to the New York State economic picture. Um, the question you asked about the uh, appropriate rate of growth is a really difficult question. The only thing I've been able to find was from a study, um, that it, you'd have to look at are threshold effects, and nobody has really looked at um, the point at which um, a, a community